Oh, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to be discussing, of course, uh, this book, uh, The Israel Lobby, by Walt and Mersheimer. And I want to say at the outset uh, that they accomplished uh, one of the most uh, remarkable uh, events that I would never have anticipated. Never in my life that I imagined that I would find Alan Dershowitz and Noam Chomsky agreeing <laughs> on anything. Uh, Dershowitz, as uh, I'm sure you all know, is a professor at Harvard Law School. Noam Chomsky is a professor at, at MIT. One is a uh, renowned and avowed Zionist, and the other is probably the country's most avowed anti-Zionist. And they both agree that this book is wrong. Uh, so that's really an accomplishment. Uh, and I would like to uh, uh, give my own uh, reflections uh, that, and again, uh, I find myself agreeing with Noam Chomsky. <laughs> Uh, and Alan Dershowitz. First, um, the authors explain uh, the title of their book, and uh, I quote, we use the lobby as a convenient shorthand term for the loose coalition of individuals and organizations who actively work to shape U.S. foreign policy in a pro-Israel direction. Uh, besides individuals and organizations, I don't know of any living being uh, in, in this country. So it means everyone in America who actively works to shape U.S. foreign policy in a pro-Israel direction. And all of that is included in the Israel lobby. That's a very broad definition. Not only includes, as they say, the, the American Jewish community, the evangelical Christian community, labor unions, in short, the overwhelming majority of all Americans. I'd like to um, point out at the beginning uh, that in the Jewish community, it was not always that way. Uh, the Jewish community was not always pro-Israel and pro-Zionist. Prior to the Holocaust, uh, we had large-scale divisions in the Jewish community, pro-Israel and anti-Israel. But the Holocaust changed the entire picture, certainly in the Jewish community. Before the Holocaust, interestingly enough, we found that uh, the Reformed Jewish movement was largely anti-Zionist. Go back to the Pittsburgh platform, uh, which enunciated the position of the reform community uh, long before um, uh, the, the Holocaust. And they opposed Zionism because they thought it raised in question their loyalty to America. The Orthodox world uh, adopted the position that Zionism was unacceptable because it raised the issue of a faith that God will bring the people of Israel back to their land rather than political action. And so the arguments raged within the Jewish community, but when, when the Holocaust took place, all those arguments disappeared. In the aftermath of that tragedy, when no nation in the world, including the United States, was willing to accept refugees in any significant number, 
support for Israel became the powerful issue that it is. So if you're talking about the American Jewish community and its support for Israel, strange that the book practically never mentions the word Holocaust or the role that the Holocaust played in the evolution of the Zionist movement. Instead, for the authors, why should there be such widespread and powerful support for Israel and for Zionism? There must be some, and as you read it, it sounds so sinister, a, an explanation of why this is so widespread. All of the organizations and individuals that they mentioned earlier find their focus on APAC as I quote again, the bottom line is that APAC, which is a de facto agent for a foreign government, has a stranglehold on the U.S. Congress. Now in another place, uh, he uh, seeks to, they seek to deflect criticism by pointing out well, APAC is a lobby like all other lobbies in this country, and they do have a legitimate place in the American political scene. The only thing is, they say, it just happens to be the most effective and the most powerful of all the lobbies. And there are innumerable lobbies in this country. But when they describe APAC as a legitimate lobby, this is the language that is used. A de facto agent for a foreign government. Uh, doesn't that sound sinister? You know, there are many other ethnic groups in this country who lobby significantly. None of them come even close to this categorization that they have a stranglehold on the U.S. Congress. Remember all the work that the Greek lobby had in relation, in terms of our relationship to Turkey. The, they don't have a stranglehold. Only APAC has a stranglehold, controls the United States Congress. How, how dangerous that sounds. Now, what troubles me uh, so much is the, the opening statement, quote, why has the United States been willing to set aside its own security and that of its allies in order to advance the interests of another state. In other words, all of the governments that we have enjoyed in this country, from Woodward Wilson to the present day, all the governments that have supported recognition of Israel, all the governments that have supported the Zionist movement, all of them have been willing to set aside the security of our country in order to advance the interest of another state. It's really an accusation that every government that we've had has not been faithful to the oath of office of protecting the United States and protecting American interests. But they've all and again, set aside their security. And why? Because APAC has a stranglehold on 
the American Congress. This assumes at the outset that if it weren't for Israel, if it weren't for APAC, if it weren't for the lobby, America would have no problems with the Muslim world, suggesting 9-11 would never have happened. Incidentally, go through the entire book and see if there's any mention of 9-11. You know, what um, is always very uh, suggestive to me is not only what a book says, but a, what a book doesn't say. There is practically no mention of any terrorist activities that have taken place in the world by Muslim fundamentalists. You might read this and imagine that 9-11 never happened, and that the only reason we went to war in Afghanistan, the only reason we went to war in Iraq, and they specifically say that we went to war in Iraq in order to protect the interests of Israel, but not because of 9-11, not because of the uh, uh, terrorist acts that have been committed in London, in Spain, in Bali, all over the world. No mention of that in the book, as though they never happened. I'll quote again. I'm reading directly from the book. Israel is a li liability in the war on terror and the broader effort to deal with rogue states. The terrorist organizations that threaten Israel do not threaten the United States. 9-11 never really happened. As for so-called rogue states in the Middle East, they are not a dire threat to vital U.S. interests, except in as much as they are a threat to Israel. Now, how, how one can, can read that uh, you know, distinguished uh, professors at great universities in this country uh, is, is really very difficult to understand. Now, uh, I quote again. The country's creation, referring to Israel, was undoubtedly an appropriate response to the long record of crimes against Jews. Not Holocaust, because that never happened, but it, there was a long record of crimes against Jews. And so the creation of Israel was an appropriate response, but it also brought about fresh crimes against a largely innocent third party, the Palestinians. Uh, I just really don't understand what, the, what he means by a third party. There, uh, if I would call them anything, I would call them a second party. Because the issue in uh, that area is the conflict between Israel and, and the Palestinians. But they are a largely innocent third party. And again, totally overlooking the long history of terrorism in that part of the world. You know, uh, it's interesting to reflect Today, and I can say literally today, and I can say literally yesterday and the day before, we are so accustomed <clears throat> to the role of suicide bombing in the world that it's uh, just a normal thing. But when did suicide bombing begin? When did they... Uh, ascend to the stage of world history. That was by the innocent third party in, uh, in, in, in Israel. That's, uh, and uh, uh, certainly we cannot uh, ignore or forget the long stream of suicide bombing that took place uh, in, in that part of the world. And, and that qualifies them to be referred to here as an innocent third party. 
Now, uh, I certainly want to pause at this point to express uh, the fact that um, there is a great deal of legitimate criticism, and I uh, bear my own share of le what I feel legitimately criticizing the government of Israel for many of its activities over this past year and for many of the policies that it has adopted. But it hardly can lead anyone uh, to refer to the innocent third party as though the Palestinians had no role to play in the conflict uh, that is still continuing in that part of the world. But when he speaks about the creation uh, of Israel, uh, as an appropriate response to the long record of crimes against Jews, I think what also has to be remembered uh, is the earlier history of the involvement of the State of Israel. We think back to the First World War. At the conclusion of the First World War, when the Ottoman Empire was overthrown and that empire was divided by the vi victorious allies, it was the League of Nations that assigned the land of Palestine to the British, to Great Britain, for Great Britain to serve uh, as the, the, the protectorate of this land for the ultimate purpose of creating there a Jewish national home. This was a decision of the League of Nations. Was that the result of, of, of APAC? Was that the result of some American lobby that led to that decision? And the nation of Israel itself was the result of a decision by the United Nations. So was APAC the, the, the guiding force that led the United Nations to make that decision, you know, to assume that this, uh, this Israel lobby controls the world. League of Nations, United Nations, all the decisions that led to the creation of the State of Israel. Now, one of the... Um, uh, sort of precautions that uh, Walton Mersheimer make, and this is uh, very understandable. Uh, they say, they, they know that there are going to be charges that we are anti-Semitic. Well, by saying that, uh, it's, a, it's a sort of a crude effort to deflect that kind of a charge. Uh, but our memories are, are, are long. I clearly recall that when Hitler rose to power and when Hitler launched his program of extermination of the Jews, that what he said was at the outset that it was the Jews who had led to the defeat of Germany. It was the Jews who had led to the economic crisis in Germany, and that all of the blame falls on the Jewish people. And when uh, you, know, you, you read about the protocols of the elders of Zion, again, the same kind of charge. They run the world. And here we find exactly what, the, in the same tone, that they are so powerful, they determine American policy and determine world policy um, that resulted in, in this state, uh, the state of Israel. Another quote, I'm just I'm not randomly, but uh, here and there, I want to bring our attention to what they say in the book. The Palestinian resort to terrorism is wrong but it isn't surprising. Now, if, what they suggest that it isn't surprising is that there is a, a measure of merit to what they're doing. 
They're justified. That's why it's not surprising. I wonder whether they would ever publicly say that the attack of 9-11 was justified. It was not surprising because of all the, the policy that America is, is doing. When they say, but it is not surprising, uh, my own response is that there are no buts to terrorism. There's no way in the world that I would accept terrorism as a legitimate means of achieving political ends. Now, Along the same lines that uh, I was just referring to about the all-powerfulness uh, of, of, of Jews as reflected in, in, in such works as the Elders of Zion, uh, th they have a long section in which uh, basically they say, uh, and I can quote, um, not only do, do they have a, a stranglehold on Congress, they control the media, uh, quote, the lobby's perspective prevails in the mainstream media. Uh, they control the think tanks. Pro-Israel forces have established a commanding presence, and uh, I'm reading on from their book, the American Enterprise Institute, Brookings Institution, Center for Security Policy, the Foreign Policy Research Institute, the Heritage Foundation, the Hudson Institute, and so on. Then they go on to say they're controlling college campuses. Uh, and they point out that uh, uh, there have been established uh, a great number of uh, Israel studies programs on college campuses, and they control the campus. I'm thinking about Portland State University, where I taught for so many years. Um, We've had, and we're very proud of the Middle East Study Center at Portland State that was established back in 1960. Uh, and uh, I was a member of that faculty for uh, oh, about 35 years. And, and we had a, a very congenial relationship. Uh, we have faculty members uh, from various Arab countries, Syria uh, and Palestine, Egypt and so on. And it's only within the last uh, two years that we've had uh, a, uh, a Judaic Studies program, and they're projecting two years from now an Israel Studies uh, component of, of that department. Now, what I'm trying to say is that there have been Middle East Studies centers all over the country, some very significant ones, Princeton and Harvard, UCLA, uh, University of U a, a lot of them all over, uh, they were never regarded as agents for advancing the Arab political cause. They were and are legitimate academic institutions. And the same thing is absolutely true of all the Israeli studies program, Israel studies program at the universities. To charge, as they do here, that they are the uh, controlling bodies of campus thought uh, is utterly, utterly untrue. Now I quote again. Pressure from Israel and the lobby was not the only factor behind the decision to, to attack Iraq in March of 2003, but it was critical. Some Americans believe that this was a war for oil, but, and I'll just add my own ha-ha, there is hardly any direct evidence to support this claim. So I wonder, where is the direct evidence that supports his claim 
that pressure from Israel and the lobby was critical to the decision to invade Iraq. There's no direct evidence that oil was at play, but where was the direct evidence for what he claims to be a critical factor uh, in engaging in the war of Iraq? Now, that kind of a statement uh, appearing in a book that is just published is, is so deeply and tragically damaging because uh, we are now engaged in a, uh, in a complete reassessment of that war. Uh, we are beginning to pay the enormous price that that war has brought to our country. And questions about uh, whether we should have gone to war are raging on the political scene. So at this point, to suggest that the whole adventure there uh, really had nothing to do with any decision by our national government uh, to fight terrorism, uh, certainly not uh, to uh, guarantee a source of oil, but all the result of the Israel lobby to advance the cause of the state of Israel is a, is a uh, it's an awful charge to make. And then he completes, I complete the quote, instead he spells it out, the war was motivated in good part you know, he uses these clever terms, in good part, by a desire to make Israel more secure. Uh, it's, uh, it requires an enormous stretch of the imagination to connect uh, the war in Iraq with a desire to make Israel more secure. Uh, it goes on now. I quote again. One might argue that Israel and the lobby have not had much influence on policy towards Iran because the United States has its own reason, reasons for keeping Iran from going lukewarm. There is some truth to that. Really, I give him credit for clever writing. There is some truth to that. But Iran's nuclear ambitions do not pose a direct threat to the United States. So who do they pose a direct threat to? They don't pose, a, it doesn't even suggest that they might pose a direct threat to um, Saudi Arabia, to Kuwait. You know, one of the things that he doesn't point out in the book uh, when speaking about Iran is that the Muslim world today, certainly in that part of the world, is deeply divided between Shiites and Sunnis. The country of Iraq itself is profoundly divided on those issues. The greatest threat that Iran poses as a center of Shiite power are to the very wealthy Sunni nations like Saudi Arabia and Kuwait and the Emirates who are deeply concerned and they are America's strong allies and providers of oil and to say that Iran, Iran's nuclear ambitions do not pose a direct threat to the US is uh, totally overlooking uh, what they do pose a very direct threat to. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to um, <clears throat> to focus on one particular statement uh, uh, that, uh, that he makes. <clears throat> All of the material that I've been talking about so far 
uh, has really boiled down to differing assessments of what took place, what uh, motivations were, and they have their point of view, and I have my point of view, and everybody here has their point of view. But I would like to turn now to something that uh, really doesn't depend on, uh, on viewpoints, and it doesn't depend on theories and uh, uh, theoretical explanations of actions that have been taken, but something that uh, uh, I want to talk about as someone uh, who has directly experienced and seen with my own eyes the absolute untruth of one of the statements that they make in this book. <coughs> now I quote, <coughs> Israel is often portrayed as David confronted by Goliath, but the converse is closer to the truth. Contrary to popular belief, the Zionists had larger, better equipped, and better led forces during the 1947 War of Independence. That's an absolute lie. And I'd like to address myself to it because uh, when you come across a statement like this that is patently untrue, uh, that alone should lead one to have some serious questions about uh, the, uh, the whole argument that they, that they developed. Um, let me remind all of us of, the, of what was happening in 1947 in what was then Palestine. Uh, the British government, which uh, had the control over the land as given them uh, by the League of Nations, had at that point 100,000 troops on the ground in Palestine. Uh, my wife and I were there then. We, uh, uh, we experienced time and again, every time we took a bus downtown in Jerusalem, the bus was stopped, and British troops would get on the bus and check out everyone on that bus, searching for arms. That situation prevailed until Britain pulled out its troops just before the creation of the State of Israel. 100,000 British troops were combing the country for arms. And the Haganah did buy and store and conceal large numbers of small arms. There wasn't the faintest possibility of the existence in Palestine at the beginning of the War of Independence for the presence of a single military plane, a single tank, a single piece of artillery. It couldn't have happened under the watchful eye of the British government. Now, um, I just uh, want to relate my own personal experience uh, as I reacted to this statement the Zionists had larger, better equipped, and better led forces. Well, one third of what he said is true. They did have better led forces. But better equipped and larger? You remember that the War of Independence began when seven armies invaded Palestine. One of the armies had been equipped by the British in Jordan, uh, very well equipped. Uh, there were the Egyptian army, Iraq sent an army, Syria sent an army, Lebanon. These were all armies of 
free independent states that had air forces, that had tanks, that had artillery. Uh, I was a student at the Hebrew University in 1947, and uh, I volunteered to join the Haganah, which was the Israel uh, um, before, the, uh, before it became a state, it was the Israel Defense uh, Units. And I received military training, believe it or not. Uh, when I went in for the training, I, I never held a gun in my life. I hardly knew what it looked like. Uh, and, and there were about, in our unit, about 50. Uh, among the 50, actually, were about another 10 rabbinical students. Um, and so, uh, and we had to train in secret. Uh, all of this had to be done away from uh, any observation by the British. Uh, they handed out guns to us, or rifles. These guns came from about a dozen different countries. So here we were training, some of us had Czech guns, some American guns, British guns, Italian guns, French guns, uh, a whole variety of guns. Each one operated differently. And the instructor was trying to train us into the use of these guns. <clears throat> and it's little wonder that every, every once in a while one of the guns went off. Uh, and, and a hole would appear in, in the tent in which we were training. Uh, it was just lucky uh, that you know it didn't hit one of us before it got to the uh, to the tent. But this was a training group in preparation for the War of Independence, and he's saying that Israel won because it was better equipped. And then uh, the other uh, episode that occurred to me that I. It can personally testify to, which again illustrates how, how absolutely false this statement is. It turned out quite by accident that I was involved in what became uh, uh, one of the more almost legendary events of the War of Independence. Uh, and, and that was known as the Lamed Hay, the 35. As a matter of fact, there's a large kibbutz in Israel, um, which is called the, the Lamed Hay, the 35. And what this was uh, involved, the fact that um, uh, there were four small kibbutzim uh, called Gush Etzion, uh, between Jerusalem and Hebron, not too far, actually south of Bethlehem. And uh, they were surrounded by Arab forces, and they were running out of ammunition uh, and medical supplies. So it was decided that they would send a group of, uh, this is the number, 35 soldiers to uh, march from Jerusalem to Gush Etzion, uh, carrying uh, heavy backpacks loaded with uh, ammunition and medical supplies. Why did they do this? Because this better equipped army didn't have a single plane to drop supplies on Gush Etzion. So they had to march 35 miles at night carrying these backpacks. And uh, that was the uh, company that I was uh, with. Uh, the, and uh, I wasn't one of the group, but uh, the group went out one night and they lost their way. Uh, and they came back. And it was decided to send another group out the next night. And that was the group that I was supposed to be in. And, uh, and I was there. Uh, there was one other American uh, with us in the group, um, and uh, we were just sort of chatting with each other. And the commander was walking around the room, uh, 
uh, cheering us up or whatever. Then he stopped in front of me for some reason, and he said, uh, Stanford, have you ever gone on this length uh, hike with this backpack? And I said, no, but there's a first time for everything. So he said, well, you go next time. Just like that. And I was talking with the other American. He, he didn't even ask. If he had asked him the same question, he would have gotten the same answer. Well, the fact is that they all went out that night. They were ambushed and wiped out. So this is the larger, better equipped forces. Um, and again, bearing in mind that under the circumstances that I described, there couldn't have been larger, better equipped forces. This is what he says. So, um, you know, when I find myself reading something like this, that I know from what I've seen with my own eyes is false, uh, it raises some very serious questions about uh, everything that he says in the book. Now, uh, again, I uh, want to just close by saying uh, many of us do react very strongly to, uh, to this kind of a book. And uh, we react because of our memories. Uh, the memories of the, uh, the all through history of charges that Jews have secret powers, that they have uh, the ability to influence the policies of nations. They decide. You remember during uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, the days of uh, the House of Rothschild, why the Jews controlled all of the economies of the world. And that has led to the Holocaust. That led to uh, some of the greatest tragedies of, of our history. And, and when we read, for example, as I've read and quoted from this book, that America goes to war and sacrifices thousands of its citizens and jeopardizes its entire economy, that the main reason that we went to the war, the critical decision was made in order to secure the state of Israel, that Jewish homeland. Those are the kinds of charges that uh, lead to uh, terrible consequences if the conditions become right for those consequences. And uh, uh, I'll just close by one more quote from them. Uh, they write that uh, they know that they're going to be accused of being anti-Semites, but they want their readers to know that they really are philo-Semites. And I say to myself, with philo-Semites like you, <laughs> who needs anti-Semites? I'll take questions. Okay, great. If, if you have questions, if you could just line up over here at the mic, uh, at the microphone to the left of the room. Okay. Questions, challenges, uh, comments, whatever. <clears throat> I'd like you all to be heard. This problem that each side often has a mirror image of the other, the commercial Jewish effective man down through the ages and the Arab wheeler dealer in OPEC. How, how do we get around this, do you think? <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Did you all hear the question? <clears throat> well, I don't really have an answer. But, I, um, uh, but I'll tell you a personal uh, uh, incident that occurred uh, to me that uh, might help shed some light. Uh, years ago, back in 1985, um, 
I went to China to visit the Kaifeng Jewish community. But uh, when, I, uh, when I got to China, I was, uh, well, actually before I got there, I was invited to uh, give a lecture on Judaism to um, the Association for Social Studies in, in Beijing. Uh, and, uh, and I gave a long lecture. Um, it was long, not because I spoke that long, but they had to translate it. And the translation took twice as long as the lecture. Anyway, it was a day-long event. At the end, we had a question period, just like this. So one of the professors who was in the audience said, uh, when you spoke about Jewish history, uh, you spoke about so many persecutions and, uh, and Jews being banished from one country to go to another, uh, and uh, pogroms and attacks and so on. It was a very tragic history. Can you explain to me what did the Jews do to provoke all of that uh, uh, antagonism? So um, I was just nonplus. I didn't know what to say to him. Uh, all I, I basically said, it's not unusual to blame the victim for the crime. So what can we do? Uh, I, I really don't know. Um, uh, I, I can't answer that. <laughs> but thanks for the question. Thanks, Thank you. Rabbi Sachs, for your talk. I, I just wanted to ask a question about the, the genesis of this war in Iraq. Um, you seem to imply that the response to terrorism figured into this, as Bush claims all the time. Yet we know from articles in the New York Times and elsewhere that Cheney and Rumsfeld and this little cabal were all planning <laughs> to have a war in Iraq and, and that, the, that, that, that uh, the Treasury Secretary at the time um, wrote a book in which he said at least as early as February. <laughs> as soon as that administration got in, they were talking about going into Iraq, and that it had strategic and political, and mm -hmm. certainly, I believe, petroleum interest, <coughs> the U.S. had those interests in going into Iraq. So I just wanted to check that mm -hmm. out with you. Well, first of all, I totally agree with you. Now, in the book, um, uh, he specifically mentions the names of the, the Jewish neocons who were involved in those decisions. Uh, I, I, I thought to myself, as you know, he mentions Wolfowitz and he mentions, uh, uh, yeah, uh, all, he mentions all the Jewish names. I was thinking to myself, if Cheney had only been Jewish, <laughs> he would have had such a more powerful argument. Uh, but uh, but he has an, he has names and uh, but I certainly agree with you on that. Uh, uh, I was opposed to the war from the beginning, and it's getting worse and worse. Yeah. It's a little bit high for me. <laughs> uh, you started off the statement with that this is a this policy. This is a book that was opposed by both Noam Chomsky and Dershowitz. And then you gave Dershowitz's arguments right down the line, ignoring the, completely what Noam Chomsky had to say. Actually, the difference between Noam Chomsky and, 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 and you is that as far as Chomsky was concerned, the error was not that the APAC determined US policy, but that US policy determined the policy of APAC and Israel, that it was not Israel that was forcing them into Iran or Iraq, but American policy, the desire to take over the area of the oil. And this is the argument that was raised by him, and he, I think, pretty well presented. Now, it wasn't necessary for uh, the Mersha, whatever his name is, to, to go through all of the various parts of American development into the war. I mean, actually, that the excuse of 9-11 for carrying out the war is not, is not the real reason why the war was carried on. 
Mm -hmm. And also, I will say one thing more. I can, I can say quite a bit because I don't agree with all, anything that you said, because, <laughs> especially the idea that, that the, the, uh, the Palestinians weren't innocent people. You know, the first thing that took place was they granted, under the Balfour Agreement, they granted a section of, the, of what was Palestine to the Jews as a homeland, but they granted nothing to the Palestinians. And then after the war, the Allies again granted 52% of Palestine to who? To the Jews and nothing to the Palestinians. The Palestinians were left out, their homes were taken away and the rest. And you ask, why do they have terrorism? You know? Now, one third, I, would, I want to make another thing. This I would ask a question of you on this because this is very important. I received my last letter from Hillel. Now, from whom? Hillel, you know the Jewish organization. The oh, the Jewish organization. organization. Uh -huh. It's supposed to be a student organization, but it's it's run by the Jewish apparatus. In fact, the letter is from Bronfman, who is uh, you know runs everything in the Jewish community. But he complains that the students in the United States, the Jewish students, in the letter said writing writing to us Jews, he writes that. Eight out of ten Jewish students do not recognize their Jewish identity and are embarrassed by the situation in Israel. And it is necessary for us to go out and to convince them that what Israel does is correct. Now, I think that's quite an admission on the part of the leading Jewish organization that Israel's policy is creating a tremendous amount of anti-Semitism and shame even among Jewish students. Now, I don't know what you intend to do about that. I think it is necessary that we have to, we, the only way we're going to be able to develop any confidence among the people, among the Jews, and fight the whole development of anti-Semitism is to be opposed to Israel policy and to recognize <clears throat> we need a new situation in this world in which we don't have wars and people killing each other and we don't have people robbing them. And I could go on forever, but I could have the time to do it. But oh, you're almost just, convinced I me of that. I that question. How are you going to prevent a whole new generation from being anti-Semitic given the current policy of APAC in the United States? Okay. I, I just want to uh, uh, read the, the comment of Noam Chomsky since, since you asked me to do that. Uh, I'm quoting now from Noam Chomsky. Oh, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to read it. There are far more powerful interests that have a stake in what happens in the Persian Gulf region than does APAC or the lobby generally, such as the oil companies, the arms industry, and other special interests whose lobbying influence and campaign contributions far surpass that of the much vaunted Zionist lobby and its allied donors to congressional, congressional races. He finds that the authors have a highly selective use of evidence, and much of the evidence is, is assertion, ignores historical world affairs, and blames the lobby for issues that are not relevant. Okay, that's what Chomsky said. Okay? Well, thank you very much. <laughs>